Good morning and welcome to Sabbath School for the Edmonds Adventist Church. Today is number six in a series of 13 studies on the Bible. The topic for today in the Sabbath School Quarterly is why is interpretation needed? When we come to the Bible, why is interpretation needed? Let's begin with prayer. Lord, when we open your word and when we think about your word, we know that we always need the guidance of your spirit. And so we pray that today your spirit will guide us as we think about your word and how we understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. When it comes to the question of why is interpretation needed, I think of two different questions that I have per heard people ask, or in some cases, not really a question, but a comment that they make. I have heard people say, listen, there is no need to interpret the Bible, just read it. I want to just read the Bible. I don't need to go through some process of interpretation. Just read it and do what it says. Then there are people who have said, you know, I want to just read the Bible because I don't want any scholars coming between me and God's word. God's word should be just God's word and me. It's between the two of us. If scholars are involved, like commentaries and so forth, that just gets in the way. It puts something between me and God. It's kind of like when they said that the priests had to be between us and God, and scholars kind of become the modern-day priests that stand between us and God. So I don't want any scholars having anything to do with my reading the Bible. Well, I want to answer the second of these questions first. It'll be the shorter answer. And then I want to talk about the first question. Why do we need interpretation? Let's think about the question of scholars. The fact is that before you read the Bible, scholars are always involved. You see, you wouldn't be able to just sit down and read the Bible if there hadn't been a whole line of scholars who have worked over centuries to make that possible for you. The Bible wasn't written in English, or if you have another native language, probably not in the language that is your native language either. Even if your native language is Greek, the Greek of the New Testament is quite different than the Greek of today. Although I found that I was, when I was in Greece, I could read the signs on some of the buildings, but I wouldn't get very far with modern Greek just knowing biblical Greek. So the Bible wasn't written in English. It was written in Hebrew and Aramaic in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament. So somebody has had to translate it for you. So there are already scholars involved right there. And scholars have also had to decide what to translate. Because the Bible was not dropped down to us out of the sky in plates that somebody could just read. We have manuscripts for the New Testament, for instance. There are almost 6,000 manuscripts of all or part of the New Testament that were handwritten before the days of the printing press. And of course, before printing, that's the way all manuscripts were made. They were simply hand copied. And of course, when they were hand copied, scribes would make mistakes. So these manuscripts are not all exactly the same. Now, I will say it is amazing, amazing how much correspondence there is 
and how certain we can be for the most part of what the originals would have said. But we don't have any of the originals. We don't have any of Paul's actual letters that he wrote. We have copies of copies of copies of copies. Our very oldest copies go back into the second century, but that's still not when they were written in the first century. So scholars have had to decide from all those manuscripts what they think the best text is, and there's not complete agreement on that. In fact, even translators of a particular version will put footnotes in because they don't all agree on the text. And so when you read a modern translation and at the bottom it says, other ancient authorities add or say or omit this, those are not people they're talking about. They're talking about manuscripts, that the manuscripts differ at this point. So scholars have had to look at all those manuscripts, decide what the text is, and then scholars have had to translate it into the various languages. So what would you have to do if you were really going to read the Bible without any scholars of any kind being involved? You were going to do it just totally on your own. Well, first you'd have to learn Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic, and then you would have to collect thousands of manuscripts, compare them all, decide what the original text was, or at least the closest to the original that you can get, and then translate it. And you know what? There is no single human life that is long enough to do all of that. So we are dependent on scholars, and fortunately, there have been many faithful scholars, some of whom have given their lives for the principle that the Bible should be in the language of the people. One of the men in the 19th century who worked on manuscripts named Tischendorf actually went blind reading all of these old manuscripts. People have given a lot so that we can have the Bible. So we are dependent on and also grateful for scholars that God has used to give us the Bible in our own language so that we can read it. But now let's go back to the first question. Why interpret? That's really the question of the quarterly in today's lesson. Why is interpretation needed? Well, you know, it's impossible not to have some kind of interpretation because really, anytime we read anything, we are interpreting. The very fact that we read, we learn to read, we learn what words are, what they mean, we learn how sentences are put together, we learn how uh, nouns are different from verbs and how to understand a sentence, all that is interpretation. The fact is that it becomes second nature to us. So we don't think about it for most things that we read. It's kind of like driving the car. You remember when you first learned to drive the car? It was very tense as you tried to think of all the things you had to do at once to drive a car. You had to be looking ahead. You had to be looking in your rearview mirror. You had to know when to turn your turn signals on. You had to make the turn into the right lane. And all of that was very difficult and trying. But finally, it becomes second nature to you, and you just do it. Well, reading is the same way. We read things, and we don't think about the fact that we're going through a process of interpretation because we learned how to read and how to interpret a long time ago. But you know, even if I just read the morning news, usually in the morning I look on my phone and see what the major stories are of the morning. And when I read the morning news, sometimes that interpretation becomes more explicit. Maybe I come across a term that I don't know. And so I get out a dictionary and I look up the word in a dictionary. Or nowadays you 
often only have to tap on the word and a dictionary will automatically come up and give you the meaning of the word. Maybe I come across a place that I'm not familiar with in the news story. It says that something happened in a certain city and I wonder, well, I wonder where that city is. Well, I get out my map or I go on the computer to my, my map app, punch in the city and I find out right where it is. That's a process of interpretation. Maybe I come across an unfamiliar name and so I Google that name to find out who it is that they're talking about. Maybe I come across a custom that I've never heard of, and I wonder if this activity that they mention in another country is actually something strange that some individual just did, or if that's really the custom of the country. And so maybe I will look up the customs of that country to see. That's a process of interpretation. Now, the Bible is obviously more removed than the morning news that I read. It comes from a different culture. It comes from a different part of the world. It comes from a different time. It comes from a different language. And all those things necessitate more conscious interpretation than when I just read the morning news. It is more removed from my everyday life. And that's why a process of interpretation is important. Now, I will come back to our process of interpretation. In fact, we're going to spend much of today and next week talking about a process of interpretation. But I want to talk about a second reason why some kind of process of interpretation is important for us. The fact is, we always bring something to the text as well as read from the text. I bring my own culture, my personality, my history, my past experiences. I bring all of that to the text, and it all affects the way I read the text. One of the things that an organized process of interpretation does is help me overcome those biases that I have as I come to the text. And maybe not even biases in the bad sense, but they just make a difference in the way I read the text. Because all of those experiences do color the way I read. So I want to give you an example. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> I'm going to read a section of a very familiar story. It's the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. And I want you to listen very, very carefully. As I read this portion of the Bible, you might even look it up in the Bible as I read so that you can read along. Luke chapter 15, verses 13 to 16, talking about the prodigal son. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods of the pigs who were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now think about that passage or look at it in front of you. And think about this question. If you were asked to underline just one thing in that paragraph that gives you the main reason why this young prodigal, ended up destitute. What would you underline? Well, I heard a New Testament professor who had taught New Testament in three different places in the world. He had taught here in America in a seminary. He had taught in Africa. I don't remember which country it was in Africa. It was somewhere in Central Africa, where he had taught at a seminary there. 
And then he had taught at a seminary in Russia. In all three of those places, he asked his students to do what I just talked about. He asked them to underline the part of this passage that showed the main reason why the prodigal ended up destitute. He found out that almost all of his American students underlined the same thing. They underlined that first part of the paragraph. It was because he squandered his wealth in wild living. That's why he was destitute. He squandered his wealth in wild living. His Russian students, on the other hand, almost all gave the same answer among themselves, but it was different from the answer that almost all of his American students had given. His Russian students underlined there was a famine in the land. His African students underlined something different yet. And almost all of them underlined the same thing. They underlined what is at the end of the paragraph. No one gave him anything. That's why he was destitute, because no one would give him anything. He was asked why he thought there was such a difference in these three different cultures. And he explained it this way. He said, in America, we are a very individualistic society. Our stress is on personal responsibility. And so it's this guy's fault. He went out and squandered his wealth in wild living. That's the problem. In Russia, however, he said it's a very fatalistic society. They've been through so much there that there's a kind of, you know, whatever happens is going to happen kind of attitude. And so they underlined there was a famine in the land. What could he do? There was a famine. That's how it happened. It's a famine. He has nothing. His African students, on the other hand, live in a very communal culture where you take care of everyone in the tribe. And it's the responsibility of everyone to take care of those. It doesn't matter what they've done. They're part of your clan. They're part of your family. So even if they've squandered their own wealth and wild living, you take care of them. So the real problem they see is no one would give him anything. <coughs> you see how each group brought its own culture to the reading of the text. You know, it's true for all of us. We bring something to the text. Now, there are two ways that I think we can help mitigate our own biases when we come to the text. One of them is to pray for the Holy Spirit. That's what the Spirit does. The Spirit doesn't somehow drop the interpretation down on our heads. But the Spirit can help remove our biases and open our minds. After the resurrection, when Jesus met the disciples in Luke 24, it says he opened their minds so that they could understand the Scripture. It's one of the reasons we pray when we come to read scripture, because we ask the Holy Spirit to open our minds so that we will be able to understand. But a second way we mitigate this is through a careful process of interpretation, where we have an organized way of asking questions of the text so that we don't just bring our own ideas to the text but we try to see it within its historical perspective. Try to understand what it would have meant to the original hearers, because there are some ways I might interpret that would have been impossible for the original hearers to have understood. So we try to go back and understand the time and the culture and the history. That can sound daunting, I know, but I don't think it's as hard as we think. Actually, I think the Bible is much easier to understand than we usually think. 
In fact, sometimes the things in the Bible we have the hardest time with are the things that are easiest to understand, like love your enemies. Easy to understand, harder to do. But I think even though the Bible is easy to understand, diligent study can enhance it. And there are certain tools that we can use to help us have an organized way of understanding Scripture. Now, it's not a substitute for just reading. We need to understand the whole. I'm a firm believer that as you sit down to study the Bible, it's good to read a whole book, read the whole thing, catch the basic idea of it, then go back and do the diligent study of interpreting. So I think it's best to start by listening. But there are kind of three different ways you can think about the process of interpretation. One is to say you don't need interpretation, just read it. That's it, just read it. Well, there's something to be said for that because often just reading it will give us the overview. However, often if we just read it, we bring our own prejudices and biases to the text in ways that we could mitigate through careful study. A second problem is uh, that there are some who say, well, it's just all subjective. Really, there is no meaning except the meaning that we bring to it. This is the extreme version of postmodernism. I heard a lecture one time where the lecturer said, there's no meaning in the text. There's only what we bring. He said, the text is kind of like the stars in the heavens. They're just there. But we impose these constellations on them. And we say, you know, that's Orion. That's the Big Dipper. But other people could do it in different ways. There's no real meaning in the sky. It's just stars, but we impose a meaning by creating constellations. And he said, there's no real meaning in the text. We just impose a meaning. Well, when you really think about it, isn't that kind of absurd? Because we all the time read things and make sense out of them. And the same people make sense out of them. When we read the morning news, People don't go away with totally different understandings of the facts. Now, they may have very different opinions about those facts. So it really isn't true that it's all just subjective. But I think a process, an organized process of going to Scripture is one that helps us understand, helps mitigate the problem of what we bring to the text, and also helps us to an understanding of the text. So I want to go through now, today and next week, a process of interpretation. I would say step number one, <clears throat> step number one is that we need to choose a translation because there are lots of translations out there. So which one are you going to read? Which Bible are you going to read? Which translation? Well, I think there are some steps that can help us choose a translation wisely. I'm often asked, what's the best translation of the Bible? And there's no single answer because part of it means, uh, what is the best for what purpose? No translation is perfect. No translation can do it all. Translation is never an exact science. You know, if you give a number of people the same text, just from modern times, give them a Spanish newspaper from today and ask five interpreters to translate that, it's not going to be word for word the same. They're going to use different words to translate. And translation is not always easy. Do you translate the words, or do you translate what you think the meaning really is? Let me give you some examples of that. If a person speaking Spanish gives you something, and you say gracias, what do they say in return? Usually, 
De nada. De nada. Now, what does de nada mean? Literally, it means of nothing. So if you were translating, would you translate that of nothing? Or if somebody gives me something and I say thank you, <coughs> in English, it would be more likely that they would say, you are welcome. You're welcome. Now, the words of nothing and the words you are welcome are not the same. But the meaning is the same. So what do you do? Do you translate the words? Or do you translate what you think the meaning is? Sometimes the cultural context can even make a difference in the way you translate. I had an evening in a small class one time with Robert Bratcher. He was an executive in the uh, International Bible Society and a translator. He was the head translator for Good News for Modern Man, the today's English version. He had also been involved in translating the Bible into a lot of different dialects all around the world. There was one dialect in Africa where they made the first translation of the Bible into that dialect for people. After they published their Bible, they realized that there was a problem with Revelation 3, verse 20. Now, they had translated it correctly into the dialect. Revelation 3, 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone will open the door, I'll come in and eat with him. So, it's quite clear, right? They found out when people read the text, they got a totally wrong idea. Because in that culture, when you went to somebody's door, you did one of two things. If you came as a friend, you called their name through the door. If you came as an enemy, you knocked on the door. So when it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, that would give the idea that when Jesus says these words, he's coming as an enemy. Totally wrong idea. So they redid it and they made it, behold, I stand at the door and call. So which would be the right translation? Behold, I stand at the door and knock, which would give the wrong idea, or behold, I stand at the door and call, which is not what the original actually says, but hopefully would give the right idea. Another example, I talked to another Bible translator. He was in charge of the Bible Society's uh, translation project for a fourth of the world, all of the Asian countries. And he had been involved in the translation of many different uh, translation of the Bible into many different dialects. There was one place, an island, separate island, in the area of Indonesia, where the people had never had the Bible in their own language, and so they translated it into their own language. However, when they got to the word bread, they found out that that language had no word for bread. They have never had grain on that island. It doesn't grow grain. And so they don't have anything like bread. And they didn't even have a name for bread. So what did the translators do? Well, he was not the translator. He was the supervisor of the translator in this case. And they decided just to leave it in Greek. The Greek word for bread is artos. So when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, they said, I am the artos of life. When they came back with the translation, he asked them, what does that mean to the people who are reading it? And they said, well, it doesn't mean anything because they don't know Greek, but we just thought we better leave the word in Greek since there wasn't any word to translate. He said, well, tell me, what is the main staple food on that island?
Well, he said it, they said it was sweet potatoes. They grow sweet potatoes and they make almost everything they eat out of sweet potatoes. So now they changed it. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, that translation says, I am the sweet potato of life. Is that the way you ought to translate it? Another question that comes up is whether to use gender inclusive language or not. Some translations say in the Bible, in the Greek, it will say brothers, and we should just translate it brothers. And others say, yes, but it was their custom if they were talking about men and women to use brothers. So many translations today will say brothers and sisters. Is that legitimate? Well, translators face difficult choices. And they've made different kinds of decisions. And so one of the things you do when you select a translation of the Bible to read is decide what you want to read it for and what kind of principles of translation you want to see. So let me go through several different criteria that I think you should use when you think about a translation. By the way, it really helps to read the preface at the beginning of a translation to see what principles they use. So several principles in selecting a translation. Number one, look at the uh, translation that is translated from the original and isn't just a paraphrase translated from the English. In other words, there are some versions that instead of being translations of the original Greek and Hebrew, they are just paraphrases of another English translation. So for instance, the clear word Bible is not really a translation. It's an interpretive paraphrase of an English translation. Even the New Living Bible is actually based on a revision of an English version rather than a real translation from the Greek and Hebrew. So you want to look at the preface and make sure that this is a translation that is translated from the original languages. Number two, you want to make sure that this is a translation that takes into account those different manuscripts we talked about. You know, when the King James Version was translated, the oldest manuscripts they had of the Bible only went back to around the year eight, 900. Today we have translations or uh, manuscripts, manuscripts of the Greek New Testament that go back into the 200s. And we have manuscripts of the Old Testament that go back to times before Jesus, found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So do the translators of a version take into account these older manuscript finds and use translations based on the oldest and best manuscripts. The best translations will give you footnotes so that where there are differences, and the, the differences are not major, there aren't a lot of them, but where there are differences, they will put it in a footnote and let you know uh, where there are differences. So that's the second criterion. Look for one that gives you footnotes and lets you know where there are manuscript difference. The third criterion is you want to look at the language level. And here you may have different goals. And at times you may want one kind of language and another, another kind of language. Now let me give you one principle. The New Testament was translated into the language of the common people, or pardon me, not translated into, but written in the common language of the people. It is called Koine Greek, and the word Koine meant common or unclean. In the New Testament, when the lepers would come up and call unclean, this is the word they used. Now, it didn't mean it was dirty, but it meant it was the common, ordinary language of the people. There was a time when people thought that maybe this was some special holy language because it was different 
from the Greek philosophers that they knew about. But then there were all these discoveries made of just common, ordinary kinds of material, not philosophical writings, but the stuff that you would generally find in a waste paper basket, cases of papyrus that included grocery lists and love letters and all kinds of things. And they found out the language of the New Testament was in that kind of language, the common ordinary language that people spoke. And so that means that probably the best translation is going to be one that is in common ordinary language. Now, once upon a time, the King James was that. But remember, it was translated over 400 years ago. And so um, it's no longer the common language. But even within the common language, what level do you want? Well, different translations use different levels of English. For instance, the good news for modern man or today's English version is geared at a lower elementary school level of English. In fact, a third grader can pretty well read it. The whole New Testament only uses a vocabulary of 1,000 words. I find it's a great translation for kids. They can actually read the Bible themselves rather than just stories about the Bible. Great translation for children. Then there are some translations that are at a junior high school level, like the New Living translation. Other translations are at a high school level, the New International Version is one of those. And then there are translations that are in college-level English, like the New Revised Standard Version and the New English Bible. So you want to look for what you uh, are doing with your translation. What kind of language level do you prefer for this particular group? Then. A fourth criterion has to do with the principles of translation. Does it try to be literal? Or is it going to try and be more dynamic? Now, this is not a one or the other, but it's a spectrum of being very, very literal at one end and being much more free at the other end. There are advantages of both. Sometimes I like to use some of the more free translations, like the Message Bible. The Message Bible is, is very loose in terms of translating word for word, but sometimes I think he does a great job of capturing the real sense of the passage. And then a fifth criterion for choosing a translation is a translation is usually more reliable if it's a committee translation if there are checks and balances rather than the one person. Although people like J.B. Phillips and Eugene Peterson have been great at paraphrasing scripture in a way that speaks to us and I use them, but I wouldn't use them as my main study Bible because of the principles of translations they go on. And they're just by one person rather than a committee that has checks and balances. Finally, some translations have a bias. That's not true for very many translations. Most translations, the scholars are honest. It's interesting, in fact, that when the Revised Standard Version came out, it was supposedly done by liberals, and so conservatives decided they would make an alternative translation. And that's really kind of how the New International Version got started. But when they ended up, you know, they were good scholars on both sides and they pretty well ended up in a few. So what I want to do here as we close the part about choosing a translation is just take one tiny little verse, a proverb, and read it to you in about 15 different translations. So you get the feel for translations. And as you will see, they're all very much the same in terms of its meaning, but there is a little bit of difference, different nuances. So let me just take about, uh, well, a few minutes to read in about 
15 different translations. One verse, Proverbs 19.3, a short proverb. First, the King James Version. The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. Well, that's not real clear, is it? Uh, but we get the idea. The RSV says, when a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. The New English Bible, a man's own folly wrecks his life, and then he bears a grudge against the Lord. The New Revised Standard Version, one's own folly leads to ruin, yet the heart rages against the Lord. The Contemporary English Version, we are ruined by our own stupidity, though we blame the Lord. The Today's English, the good news for modern man. Some people ruin themselves by their own stupid actions and then blame the Lord. The New American Standard Bible, which is a Bible that tries to be very literal. The foolishness of man subverts his way and his heart rages against the Lord. Now I want to read you two different versions of the NIV. The NIV has changed. I want to read you the old NIV and then the new NIV. The old NIV says a man's own folly ruins his life yet his heart rages against the Lord. The new NIV, the international version, says, a person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. You see the difference? They've made gender inclusive language, so they don't talk about man and his. The New Living Translation, people ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they are angry at the Lord. Just a few more. Contemporary English Bible, People ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. The easy reading version, which is another one that's great for kids. People ruin their lives with the foolish things they do and then they blame the Lord for, for it. And finally, the message, Eugene Peterson. People ruin their lives by their own stupidity. So why does God always get blamed? Now, if you want to see a multiplicity of translations, go to BibleGateway.com. Bible Gateway, all one word, BibleGateway.com. And you can look up any passage of Scripture, and then there's a tab at the top where you choose what translation you want to read it in. And there are 59 different English translations there, plus lots and lots of different languages. So right at your disposal, you have a whole library of different versions, and you can try them out and read different versions. And I find that I get more out of a multiplicity of versions than just always using one version. Well, um, that's about all the time we have today. We've only looked at the first step in this process of interpretation, and that is choosing a translation. Next week, we'll go through a number of other steps in the process of interpreting scripture. Why do we interpret? And we'll look at things like text and just a number of things in this process of interpretation. Um, I'm going to have to end this today because I have another appointment on a Zoom conference coming up. Uh, I will be back at 11 o'clock for our worship service. I hope you will join me then. Let's close with prayer. Lord, we're so grateful that we have your word. It guides us, it delights us, and it gives us courage, hope, strength, and the knowledge of your grace. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in. See you at 11 o'clock for the worship service.